Well, we're carrying on today our series in Galatians. We've only just started it, so we're on chapter 2. And it is a good news situation for us. If there was a focus, Tim will bring the reading up in a moment. Um, Tim, we're reading from uh, verses 11 to 21 in chapter 2. Um, if there was a focus, I believe it's that righteousness, our right standing, is uh, not through the law, but through grace. We are right standing before God, not through the law, but through his grace. And, you know, that is such good news. That is such good news for us. It makes it accessible and achievable and enjoyable, stress-free. And I know that sometimes you come to church, and I'm the same, you know, and I know, you know lots of you are the same. You've had busy weeks, right? You want to come to church and get get the fullness of the Holy Spirit ready to charge you up like a battery to go ahead into the next week full of vigour and energy. And this is a good news story that helps that. That we can be right standing before God not by works but by his grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, from chapter 2, verse 11. It will come up on the screen. Galatians is near the back of the book. It's entitled, Paul Opposes Peter. When Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I proved that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, I know, just as I'm reading that right there, it's very difficult to understand some of these things. They are deep, deep concepts. And now I will try and unpack it. And whatever I try and do, I know is not going to be the full picture. 
So there's going to be more to what I say. Don't think you're getting the whole package in one go from me because this is a deep, deep section of scripture. Perhaps one of the deepest of all. It's a wonderful book and this is where Paul lays out his understanding of the gospel in these in these few lines he's calling Paul uh, sorry he's calling Peter a hypocrite Peter was the disciple there's going to be a picture coming up in a moment um, of the two of them Peter was the disciple that um, was kind of like the leader of the disciples very strong and uh, in, impetuous and that's him there on the left hand side P whenever you see pictures of Peter it's often with he's holding the keys um, that they say that he has the keys so that you can get into heaven of course that's not right but that's just like a an artist's impression of what it is but if you see somebody holding a key it's normally Peter and then Paul has the sword because his sharp wit was like a sword that enabled us to understand what scripture was about. So that's an artist's impression of Peter and Paul. Paul was saying to Peter that he's been a hypocrite, essentially. And you know, we're all hypocrites, aren't we? All of us. In fact, it was one of the biggest slurs on the church, especially when I was growing up. We were all told, oh, I'm not going there. That, you know, that's for hypocrites. They're hypocrites who go to church. And then the response was often, well, there's always room for one more, <laughs> which is a legitimate response because we are literally all hypocrites, even with the best intentions we don't always do what we want to do. We don't always do what we say that we're going to do. We're all hypocrites. But that's why Jesus died for us, because we're not able to fulfill things. We're not as strong as we like to think we are. And he has been that strength for us to enable us to stand before God. Even in today's society, Christians aren't exempt from being hypocrites. We have movements outside in the world that aren't exempt from being hypocritical either. The latest political movement, whatever that might be, is often very hypocritical. They might promote love and tolerance up to the point where you disagree with them, and then they become unloving and intolerant, which is typical of hypocrisy. It's in our society, it's in us as individuals. There's a cycle that we go through where even as a society, we rescue people. We then become a victim to the people that we rescue and then we persecute them. It's a common psychological cycle that happens in individuals and in societies. That's why Christ had to come for us. Because we can't do things by ourselves. We need Jesus. And Paul says to Peter that he's compromised the gospel. Because when he was in Antioch, Peter was mixing with Jews and Gentiles and you might say nothing wrong with that and you're right Gentile is basically anyone who isn't a Jew would be classed as a Gentile so in that sense I'm a Gentile as well and Peter was mixing with the Jews and the Gentiles and nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that at all no problem there but what happened was is that the other Jews were coming in and putting pressure on Peter to teach to the new Gentile believers that they should be obedient to the Old Testament law. 
the Old Testament law, which was saying that you have to eat these certain foods. The, the boys have to be circumcised. You have to do certain things on certain days. You have to wash on particular occasions and in particular ways. You have to go to the religious festivals. And the whole load of hundreds of other laws that they had to abide by in the Old Testament. And the Jews were putting pressure on Peter to enforce that on the new Christian believers. And Paul was saying, hold on there. That's not right. Things have changed. We are no longer under the old contract, the old covenant in the Old Testament. We have come into a new era. As soon as Jesus was born on earth, things changed. The new covenant, the new contract started to be written, as it were. And then when he died on the cross, that contract was sealed. And Paul summarises all of this in these verses from 15 to 21. He summarises that righteousness is not through being obedient to the law. It is through God's grace. A person cannot be right before God by obeying the law. It's only by faith in Jesus can we receive God's grace. This new age was so different, different than anybody had ever experienced or known. Mankind had never known an age like it. And we are still in that age now, that age of grace. But sometimes people are oblivious of the blessings that we have as humans, that we can, by God's grace, by faith in Jesus, stand before God without having to sacrifice animals, without having to wash on particular uh, days in particular ways. The old way has passed. The old covenant has passed. And if we, or Paul, keep the old laws, the ways of sacrificing, in order to be justified before God, then Jesus, in effect, died for nothing. The Old Testament had a sunset clause. Have you heard of that saying before, a sunset clause? Well, it's a clause that is in our society today. We still use it today. So when they make a law in Parliament, if it's a law that comes to an end at a certain time, then that has what we call a sunset clause in it. So, for example, when we had COVID, we went into a state of emergency. But that law that they passed to enter into the state of emergency had a sunset clause in it, which meant that they had to reinstitute that law once every two weeks, because otherwise we'd be in a perpetual state of emergency. And that would never get passed through Parliament. I mean, who wants to be live in a state of emergency all the time, right? So it has a sunset clause that says, after two weeks, that state of emergency finishes, and if you want another state of emergency, you have to reinstitute the law again. The Old Testament is like that. It has a sunset clause in it. Because the Old Testament comes to an end when Jesus comes to the beginning. The Old Testament is then over once the New Testament, the new way, the new contract begins. And that new contract begins with Jesus. In fact, the Old Testament looked forward to a time of Jesus. The prophets in the Old Testament said of a time to come when the Son of Man will be with us that you read particularly in Daniel 7. The Old Testament looks forward to a time of God's mercy and grace. 
a time when Jesus arrives. It has got in itself built in a sunset clause to say that the Old Testament finishes when Jesus begins. It looked forward to Jesus. And verse 18 is perhaps very difficult for us to understand. Just one of the verses. Paul says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. What does he mean by that? The thing is with the Old Testament, with all the laws, God made it so that actually we would realise that we can't do it in our own strength. Because nobody can fulfil all of those Old Testament laws. And sin itself was not forgiven with the Old Testament laws. They made the sacrifices of the animals, but that only covered over their sin. It didn't forgive them from their sin. And nobody was able to fulfil all of the laws because they were so many and so complicated. It was impossible for them. And Paul is saying, if I rebuild what I destroyed, what he's talking about is that when he gave his life to Jesus, he destroyed the Old Testament. And if he builds that back up again by telling people you've got to fulfill this law, that law, that requirement, that obligation, if you, do, if you build that up again, if you do that again, you're then making yourself a lawbreaker again. Because there's no way that you can fulfil all of the Old Testament laws. The law itself was torn down by Jesus Christ. In that he was the only one that was ever able to fulfil it. Nobody else was ever able to fulfil the Old Testament law. Only Jesus. And because he did it, he then brought it to an end. Now I know that in your hearts, some of you are saying, God is the same yesterday, today and forever. That is true. And what he says in the Old Testament is still valid, of course. However, he has chosen a different way for us to be in his presence now. It's no longer a requirement to fulfill the Old Testament law to come into God's presence. To come into God's presence now, the requirement is to believe in Jesus, to have faith in it, Jesus. That's the requirement. The Jews that Peter was with, they thought, well, if you don't fulfill the law, that means lawlessness. And if there's lawlessness, then there's no relationship with God. And if there's no relationship with God, you can't experience God's grace. And therefore, they thought that Paul was setting aside God's grace by rejecting the law and teaching others to reject the law. But actually, it's completely the other way around. Because if you embrace the Old Testament law and start being really strict with yourselves about the Old Testament law, then you nullify God's grace because you, in effect, are despising the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice then becomes pointless, superficial, unnecessary if you think you can get to God in your own strength what's the point of Jesus you nullify all that Jesus did on the cross and the sacrifice he made you cannot come into God's presence by your own works hallelujah doesn't that take the pressure off you you don't have to be super mum super dad you don't have to be the best at anything in particular 
Anybody can come into the presence of God. There's no restriction at all. You don't have to have an IQ of 150. You just need to believe in Jesus. God has made it so that to come into his presence, anybody can do it. And everybody is able to do it. This new covenant that we've got, this new contract that we've got, that God has given us, is better than the old one because it doesn't rely on our strength whatsoever. It relies on God's grace. And that grace is fueled by Christ in us. You see, when you give your life to Jesus, you put your faith in him. That's the fuel that allows you to come into God's presence. God then is saying, okay, I will give you my grace. You are forgiven. There's no middleman anymore. There's no priest that you have to go to in order to then have a conversation with God. When you give your life to Jesus, you can have a conversation with God no matter where you are or when you are. There's no rules anymore to say that you can't come into the presence of God at any time in any place. In the Old Testament, they had in the temple the Holy of Holies and only the high priest could go into that Holy of Holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement. One person, once a year, into the presence of God. Now, for you and me, we can come in any time we want, day or night. There's no restriction. Hallelujah. You don't have to get a qualification. You don't have to be approved by anybody else. It's just what God says is approval enough. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Okay, come on in. That's as simple as it is like that. He's made it simple for us. Now we are justified before God in Jesus. That justified is an interesting word because it basically means it's just as if I hadn't sinned in a way. Just as if I hadn't sinned. Because God's forgiveness for you makes you able to come into his presence as though you hadn't sinned. Because it's sin that separates us from God. Paul mentions the word justified eight times in Galatians. He mentions it 15 times in the book of Romans. He really hammers it home. That if you believe in Jesus, you are justified. And that on that day, that day when we all go to meet with the Lord, on that day of judgment, nobody escapes that. You'll be standing there and all the things that the devil has said to you over the years, all those whispers of you're not good enough. Who do you think you are? all of those whispers that you've heard in your ears, you'll be standing before God and he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because there'll be no sin for you that is counted against you. If you believe in Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. Not just covered over like it was in the Old Testament, in the old contract, but completely gone, vanished, washed clean, as white as snow, forgiven eternally, just as if you hadn't committed them in the first place. We are right before God if we believe, not if we do. We all get caught up in it, don't we? In this doing thing. I've got to do this in order to win approval. I've got to be like that. 
I've got to earn that much money in order to be accepted. I've got to wear the right clothes in order for people to like me. Thank you, Jesus, that you've taken that away. Doesn't matter what you wear. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. God can accept you into his presence right now. Today. Verse 16 of that passage. Paul says, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ. Not by works of the law, but because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. In the Old Testament, there were some people that recognised this and looked forward to the day of mercy. King David was one of them. That's one of the reasons that we say that David's heart was a heart after after God because he recognised that even as a king, he wasn't able to fulfil all of the laws and requirements. Even as a king, with all of the kingdom at his disposal, he could not fulfil the Old Testament rules. So he cries out in Psalm 147, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment. For no one living is righteous before you. No one is righteous before God, only Jesus. That's why only in Jesus can we stand before God. If we think that we are righteous, that is self-righteousness. Or what we might call nowadays entitlement. If we think that we can get to God by our own merit, our entitlement is completely wrong. It's absolutely the opposite. And David recognised that when he cried out to God for mercy. We have the privilege now of 2,000 years of knowing about Jesus. We have the privilege of easy access. Three times within this passage, Paul says it's not about keeping the law, but it's about faith in Jesus. Three times. The first time he's letting you know. The second time he's, come on, I want you to get this. And then the third time, it's like he's hammering it home. This is so important. You cannot earn your way into God's presence. So he says that he died to the law to live for Christ. We need a dead church. People say, oh, look at that church, it's dead, the worship's dead, the prayer's dead, it's all gloomy, it's terrible there, everything's dead. Well, actually, we need a dead church. We need to be dead to ourselves so that we are alive in Christ. We need to be focusing on him, not on us. It's not about us. It's about him. We need a dead church. We need to die to this having to fulfill the law, having to fulfill the requirements We need to be able to say, I'm living for God in this new age of salvation. To live for God with the power to be free from the consequences of sin. That's what we need to be able to say. That we have died in Christ. That we no longer live. That's not a suppression of our personality. It's saying that we no longer live as we're identified in the Adam We are now living and identifying in Jesus. 
What does this mean in our application as we live our lives? You know, it's so easy to make rules, isn't it? And in an old church like this, we can make rules really easy. You know, you only need to do something once and it can become a rule in an old church like this. When we've changed into breakfast church, you know, even now with this different way of doing things, we have rules, don't we? You have to do things in a particular way. so easy to make a rule we have them in our lives and we end up beating ourselves up with our own rules that we make for ourselves it's the have to's i have to go to church on sunday i have to read my bible every day i have to pray every day and if i don't do that well then i'm not a good person and i'm not worth anything and i really beat myself up the have to's I have to not sleep around I have to eat a vegan diet now all of those things that I've just said are good but if they become have to's we create a rule for ourselves which separates us from God I go to church because that's where I meet with God I want to go to church, not because I have to. I read my Bible because that's where I hear from God. Not because I have to, but because I want to. I want to yearn after him. And I'm not setting myself up as somebody that's you know, holier than you kind of thing, because I, my life is just a roller coaster, just like yours is. You know, I get the ups and downs as well. And over the past couple of months, you know, I've been on a, you know, a slopey down, if I'm honest. I need to get in that right place with God again. And the irony is, the further away that you get from God, the harder it is to get back up. The closer that you are, the more blessed you are. It's right that our society and us, we need some moral structure. Of course we do. But the answer is more of Jesus. It's not more rules. The answer is, yeah, we do need to read our Bible, but not in the same in a, in a way of making it a punishment or a burden on us. Yes, we do need to tithe and give our offerings, but I tithe and offer because God has given me a generous heart, not because I have to. There's no rule in the New Testament to say that you have to, but it's to be generous and kind. I do these things because Jesus is in me and I am already right before God. I don't need to earn it. Indeed, I cannot earn my salvation. What happened with Peter and Paul after their set to, as it were? Well, we don't exactly know. But the clues are there, I think. If you, if you think that Paul, after this time, never thought of Peter as a backslider. He never referred to him as somebody who was a false brother in Christ after this. And in the book of Corinthians, he actually commends Peter in chapter 1, 3, 9 and 15. And Peter commends Paul in his letter to Peter, chapter 3. I believe that they were reconciled. I believe that Peter saw the error of his ways and in his humility turned and changed. 
That's what made him a good leader. He was able to be flexible. Now there are some questions on your tables. They come up on the screen as well. If you want to just talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes and ask those questions. Um, what religious have-tos and musts do you find difficult? And Jesus has forgiven you. Yes or no? Uh, 